Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply, and this video is to bring you a closer look at the Corbin Rust One ML 2010 NSM 630. This is a uh, mortise passage set in a particular trim and in a particular finish, and we're going to go over the entire item. We'll start with a visual review, contents of the box kind of review. Certainly first will be the mortise cassette. Okay, this is what the mortise cassette looks like. Why is it called the cassette? Well, if you use your imagination, um, it may look like a cassette. Um, this is a passage function, which means that it will of course be uh, always unlocked, always active from both sides. Inside with the mortise cassette is going to be the armor front and the term armor front uh, applies to an additional plate of material that's added to the edge of the mortise lock case. Of a uh, misalignment there on the on the lock, latch bolt body. It shouldn't ship from the factory that way. Um, okay, we've got that all sorted out. Okay, the armor front is a term used for a plate added to the edge of the mortise lock. In old style mortise locks, locks from a hundred years ago. Uh, 1920s, let's say, um, you would have seen, and you can still see today, a mortise lock that will have a very large and thick piece of metal here, maybe a quarter inch thick. And through that metal will project or give access to everything that you need, the latch bolt, any stop works that would occur. This is a passage, so there are no, no buttons or stop works the screws to hold the uh, cylinder in, okay, uh, that this of, does not feature. But in that same catalog by very likely Corbin Russwin, um, you would see other models that would feature an applied armor front like this. That's a cleaner look because it's going to cover uh, certain aspects of the mortise lock body that are maybe simply better off not exposed to the exterior side of the lock. And namely, what I mean by that is the holes that the screws that hold the body to the edge of the door, the screws that would hold the cylinders into the lock case. So really all that would project from the lock with an armor front application would be the latch, a deadbolt, and any stop works. The screws that hold the armor front literally just hold it to the lock case it itself as a result of this tap hole and this tap hole. Okay. And we can illustrate that by looking at some of those period catalogs, and let's do so now. Now, from within our website to the manufacturer's page for Corbin Russwin, there are some very um, positively old catalogs. Um, you know, late, you know, 19th century, 1871 up to 1932. Now, I have a catalog pulled open here which is the 1905 catalog and this would this is what a mortise lock would look like without that armor front it's basically a solid piece that through which you have access to the screws so that's what it would look like that's what a lock would look like without an armor front um, you get into and I'm using a Yale catalog from the Yale web uh, page within our site you can get to there by clicking manufacturers and then going to Yale. It's alphabetical. Down on this side are some very old catalogs as well. And from their 1915 catalog, they state the, and here's what an armor front changes the look to. Now you've got two plates 
where before we had just one. And the purpose is to protect the set screw, which holds the cylinder in place. Without this protection, if the screw, um, if the set screw A, shown as A, I guess they're saying, A here, were to be unscrewed when the door is open, you could easily unthread that cylinder. It would be possible to remove the cylinder and lock and unlock the door without the key. So I guess they're saying if someone was going to intentionally tamper with the lock, unthread that screw so as to remove it from the seating into the groove in the side of a common mortise cylinder, you would be able to easily unthread the cylinder, literally insert your finger, and retract the latch bolt ultimately. Um, the deadbolt, I should say. You'd be able to retract the deadbolt, and then the trim would simply allow you to enter. The armor plate also carries the finish and can be removed when the door is painted, thus saving it from being dabbed with paint. Looking at the 1929 catalog, they have a very similar definition uh, of, they have the same definition in fact, but you get into seeing what it would look like. And all you're really seeing here would be again your stop works, which in modern locks are positioned closer to each other, but just the exposed plate that's finished, screws to hold the plate onto the lock, onto the cassette structure, and then it's pierced through for your latch bolt. Okay. And that's what the role of the armor front is. Now, as we continue through the review of the contents of the box, that's, a, that's where your armor, fr uh, armor front history comes in, I suppose. Uh, you'll get, the, of course, the mortise cassette or the mortise case. There will also be the template, which we're going to go over in detail. There's also going to be a strike plate. Um, I am not a fan at all of this type of strike plate. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that this is a completely reversible strike that will you that can be used in all applications. Okay, it's a flat lip arrangement. That means that um, when the latch bolt strikes the lip, okay. It's going to hit basically practically two perpendicular surfaces. Okay, I don't like that. And, and while it's obviously going to work, I would prefer if the, and that latch came loose again, I would prefer if this was curved. If they make it curved, it's going to be handed in, in all instances. This is a non-handed strike. With a straight lip, it has the preparation for the deadbolt, and it also has the preparation for the latch bolt. The holes are partially countersunk on both sides, so that you could install it this way, you know, for a right-hand reverse door, or for a left-hand reverse door, or for a right hand, or for a left hand. It would certainly work. Um, the other thing that I don't love is the positioning of the hole for the deadbolt. It's completely in alignment with the hole for the latch. I would like for that to be a bit offset. And they do make it a little bit wider because what happens in an application with weather stripping, obviously this works, um, but in an application with weather stripping, you'll, you will see strike plates from uh, certain manufacturers that they may be a boutique manufacturer, or a custom manufacturer, that when they've got a hole in the strike for the deadbolt and the latch, that that deadbolt strike is actually going to be biased away from the face of the stop a little bit. And the, and the reasoning is your door closes, it latches, the weather stripping is compressed, and then pushes the door back out ever so slightly. Well, that changes. Now, when that door relaxes, the location of the deadbolt is now just 
small amount away further from the stop of the face of the stop but how Corbin Russwin compensates for that is the inside width of the deadbolt is greater than the inside width of the latch bolt area by 50 thousandths of an inch when in fact the thickness of the latch bolt versus the thickness the thickness of the latch bolt versus the thickness of the deadbolt the latch bolt's actually a little bit th uh, thicker so to speak um, so the fact that they've made the preparation wider maybe by over maybe by every bit of 80 thousandths wider they've put it straight with the preparation here with the latch bolt prep um, made that wider to compensate and therefore in this regard this strike will work with or without weather stripping because of they've made it wider than it needs to be um, and the latch bolt and the deadbolt should be a little bit skinnier as well um, the downside of that obviously is you have you you turn that trim and retract the latch and you shake the door you've got a little more movement than you'd like to have however take it out of the box go to the door and install it and it's all going to work and that's you know obviously what they're going for with this and when we get to the product catalog we're going to scroll through and look at the accessories and we'll discover whether or not um, it is available in a handed curved lip style strike you don't need to have all these holes in here um, for this strike and since we're speaking of the strike or perhaps ranting uh, about the strike, I will say that there's no dust box included. And, uh, you know, if, if the manufacturer is going to punch all these un these unnecessary additional large holes through the strike, they should be giving you a dust box. Um, Knockdown drywall frames are certainly going to have, um, uh, you can expect that they're not going to have any sort of, um, additional steel welded into them uh, to account to be dust boxes you only see those on masonry frames so I would say that it would be a lapse on the manufacturer that a dust box is not included because um, a dust box is a piece of metal or more so these days plastic that will uh, go behind the strike when you install it and literally seal off this entire interior area because you don't want particulate from the wall creeping into the space, which is going to happen. Uh, it's just simply the bottom line. Plus, it's quite unsightly to look through these two big unnecessary holes and to see, you know, raw studs, drywall flaking, etc. So that would be certainly a downside of the strike and the fact, uh, unfortunately, that there is no dust box included. Okay, let's proceed on with this visual tour of this item. Now, as we continue through the visual tour of the material, this is an NSM trim, NSM, and that is going to bear with me. This is going to be the Newport lever. and is going to that's your new port lever okay this hardware was ordered as 630 finish which means stainless steel satin stainless in a brushed finish that would be your exterior uh, obviously the interior is going to be the same lever design but just there we go very typical common handle the new port this is an M escutcheon uh, versus the typical A rose um, your NS is going to be your new port the M is going to be your escutcheon and that escutcheon there's of course an exterior and an interior and the M escutcheon, according to the manufacturer's catalog, which we'll get to, is two and a quarter inch wide. Okay. And it is seven and a half inch tall. Okay. Really nice. Um, this is a 
ML2010, and we'll get to the functions, but that's a passage. I was holding it upside down. The only hole, of course, would be for your trim to go through the door uh, and, the, and the escutcheon hardware itself. You will get your mounting hubs that are here, and when we go over the installation instructions, we're going to talk about those in particular. Uh, you will get a couple of screws, and that will allow you to mount the two escutcheon plates to each other. The interior, as you can see here, with the two dimpled holes in it, that will run, those screws will run through the door itself and then into the brazed bronze bushings that are on, on the inside that are drilled and tapped. Um, after that, you're going to get your screw package, screws for the strike, screws for the lock body, screws for the armor front, and then there's this one funny screw which we'll talk about when we get to the installation instructions. Now, let us review the link below this video to the cut sheet, and then we will tackle uh, the other documents as well, which will be the um, product catalog, the installation instructions, and the template. And let's do that right now on camera. And now we're looking at the just the cut sheet, and all the cut sheet is going to show us is an overview of the function of the lock. And we're looking at a ML2010 here, typically called a passage. The function description in this column will be an elegant, um, detailed yet quite brief description of how the lock will work. Okay, this column of function description is the best way to fully understand how a lock works um, in just written in plain English. <clears throat> and the best of those are ones that are done, and, and, almost, and all of them are done from your major manufacturers in such a way where there's not duplicate information. Nothing is said twice. Very brief but elegant. Latch bolt by grip either side, <clears throat> I might say latch bolt by trim either side, both sides always free. Okay, So you can rotate the latch on either side and both of them are always unlocked. And as you look through this function column, you'll see how elegant they are. However, the F01, the ANSI number, that's an important number because you can literally take that number and look in any manufacturer's catalog and come up with the identical function. So you'll very often see specifications that don't list a part number from the manufacturer for a lock. They're giving you the ANSI number. Okay? They might say use a lock set from Yale, Sargent, or Schlegg. Um, so long as it's, you know, and we want an F01 function, <clears throat> we need a handicap compliant trim, uh, base material to be you know, stainless steel or brass, whatever it is. But the F01 is the universal translator, so to speak. So that will get you to any compatible function from any manufacturer. Then when we scroll down, we will get to the NSM trim. And that's the new port. The NS is the new port. Okay, So that's our lever there. And on the first page, they're going to show us the A rows the B rows, with the difference being the A is wrought and the B is cast. Inexpensive, more expensive. You could certainly make an argument, not as heavy duty or resistant to impact, very heavy duty and resistant to impact. You'll always see cast, whether it be roses or wall stops on government projects, you know, public libraries, you know, hospitals, they're going to want the robust material. They'll need it because of the volume of use. Now here's our M. So we're dealing with an NSM trim. Okay. That discussion is wrought rather than poured and cast. Um, just options. Neither of these apply to what we're doing. We're certainly not doing master ring and um, laser engraving on lever or discussion. Okay. Might be nice to have that say pull, you know, in that sort of environment. The lever is indeed cast with a raw discussion. 
And that is the product uh, cut sheet for this lock. The next step is to go through the entire ML2000 series catalog, and we will uh, actually do that. And we will scroll through their catalog and pick up any, um, any concepts, any ideas that are germane uh, to our ML2010 NSM 630, but also point out anything important uh, regarding the line whatsoever. So let's, let's start with that next. Now we're going to begin with a review of the ML2000 series product catalog. And the ML2000 is a grade one mortise lock um, that, as it states, is designed to meet the rigors of high traffic commercial, institutional, industrial, and government applications. The bottom line is Grade one means a million cycles. This has been tested to a million cycles. It doesn't <laughs> magically stop working at a million in one cycle. Uh, this lock, uh, depending on how it's used, and I suppose the frequency of use, is uh, it would probably last several millions of cycles. I don't know. The factory probably doesn't know. They may have tested the lock and pulled the plug on the uh, testing rig at five million cycles. Who knows? but it meets the most stringent of requirements of it being a grade one lock, a million cycles. Uh, features a 10-year um, warranty, okay? Offices, schools, hospitals, hotels, and other high-use applications. Um, flexible, the ML2000 series has a multifunction uh, lock body capable of producing 12 different configurations which is the ML2054. Uh, in addition to the multi-function capability, allowing 12 function to be configured from one lock body, the ML2054 uses a universal lock body that you can configure it into other functions without disassembling the lock. So let's just jump right to the ML2054 and let's just take a look at that. And when we jump from our initial instance of the ML2054, it will tell us or take us to the function page, multifunction capable, see page 10 for more info. So let's scroll down to page 10. Um, and here we go. The, current, the ML2054 uses a universal lock body with the ability to reconfigure into 11 other functions without disassembling the lock case using few additional parts. All new and existing ML2054 function mortise locks provide this flexibility. So basically what's happening here is with that single lock body, and, and the question becomes, um, first of all, why would you need to know this? Why is this important? The other uh, perspective on this is, well, sure, um, you know, they're talking about a lock that doesn't feature a um, deadbolt function. And as a result, the lock case itself can be configured into a passage, easy. Just don't add anything to it. Um, you know, you want it to be a double cylinder institution, always rigid on both sides? Sure, add, add keys to both sides of the lock. From my perspective of being a distributor, we certainly understand that the body itself can be expected to behave in other configurations, um, in particular because of how Corbin Russwin builds the mortise body where they can, with a screw, control which side of the lock is rigid and which side is free. Um, and then you're basically just adding key control over each side or one side and or a thumb turn. So it'll operate in lots of different ways. But the reason that it might be important to you is because you might be in a scenario where you discover that you need an ML2032. I just sold 10 of them. Um, double, uh, always rigid, double cylinder. You always need the key to pass. Well, you can easily do that with the ML2054. You simply need to add another cylinder, purchase a cylinder. Well, you're going to need possibly trim if it's a scussion, or if you don't have any function holes drilled in its sectional trim, 
well then it's okay because you'll just drill that extra hole but then you'll just secure that side down using the red screw that we'll get to uh, when we hit the installation instructions so you can lock that down again why it's important to you is because it does give you some flexibility and occasionally gives you a you know an air quote to get out of free jail card when you don't have to throw out a lock because you need a different function um, you know it can be as it can be as messy as already having function holes well that's a problem that's a door problem but the lock can be relatively easily configured to handle it so back to our aesthetics complement any application with the full range of trim designs and finishes offered and we're going to talk about the trims and I'll say that we live in a renaissance period when it comes to availability as well key advantages patented quick release pardon me quick reversible feature enables reversal of hands without disassembling the lock case um, the ability to rehand the lock without needing to take the lock case off is very important for the average installer the average installer is truthfully a person who does not make a make a, a living installing hardware exclusively those people that do usually get the installations that are well beyond um, just installing mortise locks they'll be given applications where very uh, unusual machining uh, is required very uh, close um, adherence to dimensional requirements for instance pivots where you have a vertical axis of pivoting that must be completely plumb so not to use the term dumbing down but making the installation more accessible to just the average person who is not an expert in door hardware is not a disadvantage um, I don't believe that making it easily reversible compromises the lock in such a way that would make it inferior to a lock that cannot be reversed um, it would certainly be arguable to say that if you were to make a, a lock that would be non-reversible to be more robust sure but this lock already meets the most stringent of ANSI BHMA grades it's already a million cycle lock you know unless they come up with a grade you know 1A or you know whatever uh, however they might market that term that might say 4 million cycles um, then that's just the environment we live in security trims are available for vandal, vandal resistant uh, resistance I've supplied a Corbin Ruswin lock recently to a cell tower um, in the in New England and they wanted that trim to be of course vandal resistant security trims are also available um, in addition to vandal resistance can be used with new or existing Corbin Ruswin key systems also accept cylinders for most other manufacturers so a moment on that Corbin Ruswin has an incredibly deep and long lineage of key systems Corbin PF Corbin Russell and Irwin Corbin Ruswin to take a to dip your toe into the world of key systems would be a trip to our manufacturers page again and you're going to be looking for a document called cylinder manual regardless of the year and as you open up that cylinder manual and this is a document that is freely available to all and is the governing document when it comes to all things cylinder and keying from Corbin and Ruswin and Corbin Ruswin and as you scroll through this document you will get to not only a history a complete his authorized history of Corbin and Ruswin and Corbin Ruswin but then you're gonna pull up all of the keyways available okay and as you see I continue to scroll through there's gonna be more of it and more of it then you'll get over to what I would call the depth and spacing chart charts that are here for each of the key classes uh, systems so to speak Corbin has Corbin Corbin Ruswin has pre system 70 pre system 70 and system 70 and this starts on page 65 okay and will give you all of the keyways and what it applies to pre system 70 is a two-step system in system 70 which was brought into um, active use in 1970 uh, is a single step system so you'll be able to pull up all your depth and spacing charts for all Corbin Ruswin material 
And there are there are keyways that are still active that are over 100 years old that can be done. The point of the the point of the matter is this: Corbin, P.F. Corbin, Russwin, they have been around for literally over well over a century, and there are cylinders out there that are decades and decades and decades old. And the ability of the manufacturer to service that material using current material is crucial because you could literally have a you could have an apartment building that was built in the 1940s um, and is all Corbin Keyway. The Empire State Building was built with all Corbin lock sets, master ring locks. I don't know if there's any of that still in the building. I would imagine there has to be. Um, but those, those cylinders are out there. The point of being able to take a lock from the year 2019 and slap a cylinder that was a keyway that was unveiled in 19, you know, uh, 1898. Does that mean something? It does because it's a it's an apartment building where there's 300 apartments and they all have this old Corbin keyway. What are you going to do? You know, you want to stick with Corbin? Stick with Corbin. Provides life safety and security in a single door prep, saving the additional cost of a deadlock. You'll be able to incorporate that deadbolt. Through bolted trims for proper alignment and increased security, we d demonstrated that earlier, and we did talk about the multifunction lock body. Let's continue on with the tour of the product catalog. Okay, now as we uh, continue through our review, handing, quickly reversible, this lock set can be rehanded. I can't think of a version of this that is handed. Um, there are certainly going to be, I think, when you get into some high security and vandal resistant, but we'll discover that. Inch and three quarter is standard. You can certainly have this lock manufactured for thicker doors. Doing something thinner might be a, might, might be a trial. And the back set is indeed two and three quarter, which is a uh, dimension from the edge of the door to the center of the hole. And that back set is really determined from the edge of the door, but in particular from the center of the door. I'm going to exaggerate that bevel a little bit more. You've got four different door styles, square, rabbited, beveled, radius. The back set, the back set is always referenced from the center of the thickness of the door to the hole that you're drilling or to the um, reinforcement that you might be putting in. And be mindful that it, when you're measuring, if you measure from here back two and three quarter and here back two and three quarter, those holes are going to just miss each other. Okay? So be mindful that that's where it's referred to or referenced from, I should say. Um, lock case, heavy gauge, five, um, heavy gauge steel, five and seven eighths by four inch. That's the case alone, not including the mounting tab. The front is heavy gauge, 8 inch overall height, and the front is what the um, is what the armor front, the front of the lock case is what the armored front attaches to. And they say that it will accommodate doors that are beveled or square edge, and that's because the front will actually, if we're looking at it in cross section, little screw here that will allow this front to go like this to be square or to accommodate you know whatever bevel that you have going as you loosen that screw you'll be able to rotate this plate back and forth to accommodate any condition that you're dealing with and that's what they're referring to there latch bolt two-piece mechanical with anti-friction insert this lock does not have an anti-friction insert at all um, that is generally a small nylon tip that's installed. Um, unless, of course, they are referring to literally the small portion in the front that would make it anti-friction, uh, which is probably what they're doing because as you push on that small anti-friction piece, um, it will force the latch bolt to collapse and fall back into the lock housing. Auxiliary latch bolt. Uh, this lock does not have 
because it's a passage. Now an auxiliary latch would be something that you're going to see in a keyed lock and it's that little spring-loaded tab that generally will stick out of the edge of the lock as well. So if it was a keyed function, you could have your deadbolt, you could have your latch, then you would have your small little auxiliary latch. And this guy right here, when the door is closed, that will be held within the lock case, preventing the latch bolt itself from being loited or tampered or pushed back. It basically locks the latch bolt down, and that is, of course, a requirement in a uh, fire rated scenario on your keyed locks. Um, or I, I, what I'm trying to say is that principle can be found on fire rated hardware, especially um, exit devices is where I see that very commonly. Okay. Occupancy indicators are listed and they are incredibly common nowadays. Occupancy indicators not only on the exterior of the door but the interior as well. I've recently done a job where someone, it's a dental office and they literally have occupancy indicators on both sides of the door because they want their clients to know what is the condition of that door. Um, even though on the inside you would have emergency immediate egress by rotating the trim um, and it will retract you know, your thumb turn, your deadbolt, your latch, whatever would happen um, would, would be accommodated. But apparently the client base of this dentist's office, you know, and I, and I certainly agree that it would be handy to see that, to know the condition of the lock when they're inside, unlocked or locked. The hub is the portion of the mortise lock where the uh, spindle goes through. Now as we pick up back at the hub here, we can take a look at the parts manual, which is linked to down below. And there are actually two parts manual manuals. One is for locks manufactured after 2016, and one is for locks manufactured prior to 2016. So as we're looking uh, at the ML2010 function lock, we have the lever version here. And the hub is literally our Item number six and number five. Okay. However, there is a little bit of confusion, I think, in the sense that I've been told from the factory that the hubs for the knob or the lever version are the same, but they're clearly indicated as different. This is the ML2010 passage for knob. This is the knob for, for a passage clearly diamond shaped with their own part number, part four. But when we look at the lever version, okay, we're clearly de dealing with a, a hub that will accept spindles square or on a diamond pattern and then different part numbers. Part number six, Okay. So the factory's told me that they're the same, but the parts manual are different. I asked the factory to clarify. They were unable to clarify that um, satisfactorily. So I'm going to say that the parts diagram is probably the governing document on this matter. Let's take a look back uh, and move on. Spacing, knob, lever to cylinder is 3 and 5 eighths. So the thumb turn is 2 and 7 sixteenths. Um, nice to know. I'm not sure why they indicate that in the product catalog. Wrought brass, bronze, or stainless steel strike. The ANSI straight lip is standard with an inch and an eighth lip to center. Optional strikes, lip lengths, and wrought steel box, uh, wrought dust boxes are available. So when they say um, inch and an eighth lip to center, that's important to know because what it means is when you have a strike plate, and in fact all strike plates, what they're referring to is the center line of the screw hole to the edge of the lip. That's lip to center is what they're referring to. Inch and an eighth is a little bit short, um, but not unnecessarily short. Uh, you'll find strikes that are typical inch and three sixteenths. 
Um, it's very common that you'll need an extended lip strike, and you can certainly order that. Um, and we'll get, we'll definitely get to the other uh, strikes that are there. The cylinders, if there is one included, would be a brass six pin, and the L4 is the standard keyway from Corbett Ruswin. But again, going back to that lineage, you can order that with any active um, cylinder that would be um, a candidate for new work. If it's an inactive keyway, they would produce that keyway based on available machining, uh, or I should say tooling, when you are supporting an existing system. If they have a sunsetted keyway, you wouldn't be able to establish a new project in that old keyway, but they would support it. Two nickel silver standard keys. Nickel silver was once called German silver, a very durable type of key, certainly more durable than a brass key, um, is con and is considered a, a high caliber um, base material for the key to be made from. Lots of uh, keying, lots of keying can be accomplished uh, in the Corbin Russwin universe. Master ring is its own uh, subsection of discussion, um, but keep in mind if you're doing keyed lock sets, they can definitely give you probably what you need, including uh, standard, um, restricted, protected, high security, um, and then that master ring. 10-year warranty, as we talked about earlier. It's grade one, certified ANSI A156.13. Also, A117.1, that's the hand, that's the ADA code passed in 1991, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And this lock, all of their locks, um, not all of their, their, their locks, but they have a full complement of material that is compatible and uh, compliant with A117 along with UL, uh, UL and UL10C, positive pressure, depending on how the local code defines the way in which a fire door is going to be classified and tested and expected to be provided as a system of fire rating. What I mean by that is you could have neutral pressure and positive pressure, so depending on how your jurisdiction is uh, requiring it to be compliant with. Um, they are saying they're positive pressure compliant. California state code, I don't know much about that, not ever living in California. Uh, windstorm and hurricane rated. Um, we, uh, When you do a windstorm, or and I'm familiar with windstorm, um, when you order a windstorm rated product, you will follow the guidelines of the manufacturer of the door and the options of hardware that their system has been tested with. Corbin Russwin being a part of Asa Abloy, and under that umbrella will certainly fit Seco, uh, who has the most, the broadest available windstorm rated material. Uh, and lots of people make windstorm, but there's there's at least one instance I'm aware of that no one but Seco makes it. So they're who I think of when it comes to windstorm. You know, and just because we're talking windstorm, let's take a look quickly in the website. If you get to the manufacturer's page for Seco, the windstorm data, windstorm hurricane in Florida building code approvals is here, and that can be reviewed. It's um, it is certainly available from. Okay, so we've got that document open, and this is all their windstorm Florida listings at, at least, which is where I'm located. So you would literally follow what they've done and how they've tested the material. Okay, they have that all the parts listed here and Corbin Ruswin's material is certainly going to come in you know if you're looking at um, single doors within the constraints of the size ML2000 will certainly be listed <clears throat> anyway as an aside an interesting uh, look at that uh, as well okay so back to the product catalog as we're looking at it here Getting down into the different finishes, suffice it to say that they can do a mountain of finishes. These are the ones they list. Now, I've seen some uh, recent marketing documentation from Asa Abloy that basically encourages you to ask for special finishes. For instance, white suede powder coat. Okay, Black is a very popular finish nowadays, and they can do black suede powder coat. And you'll be able to get that finish from their other 
sister companies as well, Rockwood, McKinney, Sargent, etc. But these are the ones that they list here. I've recently ordered 611 from Corbin, which is polished bronze. Uh, they list it here, 611, uh, on a master ring cylinder. It's definitely polished bronze. Um, little overview. Back to our adjustable front. We'll go over that a little bit later. Then we get to the function pages where you can review all of the different functions. And like I had said earlier, that ANSI column, that's a really great cheat sheet, so to speak, the function description. And then as you scroll through, and if you study these, you'll eventually, hopefully, find the function that you need. And there's just several and many. There's always been a lot of mortise lock functions um, in my 30 years within the industry. But the quantity has certainly continued to grow. And you know, a question is, well, why aren't that, there are that many functions in a cylindrical lock? Well, you have a lot more real estate in your mortise case to fit a lot more moving parts, right? You've got lots of room, you know, inside of here to fit moving parts. Lots of, lots of room. And the other thing is, why is a mortise lock considered a substantially robust heaviest of duty type of lock. Well, the logic is you have a lot of lock to defeat if you're going to try to break the lock, vandalize the lock, etc. You just there's a lot of it there to get to bypass. Okay. So those functions you can review. We're obviously doing the 2010, which we had covered earlier. Um, scrolling through, they're going to get to um, electrified functions of these locks, specialty locks that will incorporate um, the ability to know what's happening at the lock, and in particular, latch bolt monitoring, request to exit. Latch bolt monitoring is nice because you can report back the condition of the latch bolt. Is someone loiting the latch bolt, tampering with it? Request to exit is obviously going to be... Request to exit monitor is, of course, really important when you're dealing with the ability to have your trim communicate to something else, maybe releasing, you know, maybe maybe reporting back to that same central station that the trim has been activated. Security monitor, two switches in series that monitors lock status, locked or unlocked, and auxiliary latch position as well. And they're in series, so if one or the other goes, you'll have a condition that trips. Additional electrified trim, you know, the the state of the world that we live in now is one that you need this sort of reporting. Uh, so we're going to we're going to continue to scroll through and bypass the ML twenty nine hundred series functions that are focusing on that high sort of report reporting ability, electrified ability. Um, obviously, electric latch retraction, electrified control over the lock. Then we get into their different trims. The um, LWA is nice, and here's why. It's simply going to be lighter than a cast lever, okay? Wrought is going to be considered tubular, and cast is going to be considered a solid handle. So that's nice because it's a much lighter handle, and you can expect um, there to be less wear and tear on your lock cassette, on your springs that are involved there. So there are times when a hollow tube is an advantage um, on your trim. Let's face it, you're not going to probably ever wear that material through. You might wear the finish off um, with enough use, but you're not going to puncture the tube. Um, but it sure is a nice thing four million cycles down the road and your springs are still nice and healthy because they're not returning back up a cast lever. And I just put that Newport lever onto the scale, which weighs 0.82 pound, and I would bet the wrought version of this lever is a third of that sort of weight. And as you can, you can just scroll through, look at all the different trim. Okay, eventually we're going to get to their security and vandal resistant trim. There's our our Newport, which is what we're doing. NSM is our trim. Okay, we've got a cast lever, Newport cast lever with a wrought discussion. Very nice and attractive. Okay, they make a narrow style as well. Other options are available on this trim if you're doing master ring 
it would be a concealed plug that they refer to. Again, a very separate conversation. Continue to scroll through. Global just did a project of a bunch of GZM was the trim. Global knobs with discussion trim. That's a mid-century classic, that Yankee style knob. In a building built in the 1950s, you're likely to see Yankee knobs, at least in my experience. Then you get into other options in terms of rows options, lots of different options here. Um, other than the discussions mentioned earlier, you've got some decorative discussions, decorative thumb turns, which are nice. And I had said earlier, we're going to talk about the fact that we are living in a renaissance period, meaning once upon a time, you really didn't have this many options. Um, in 1990, 1991, when ADA was passed and everyone went overnight from knobs to levers, there were not a lot of options of levers. Well, today there's tons of options. Um, and Asa Abloy does a great job uh, at making options available, not only in the finishes we talked about earlier, um, but in the physical build of the hardware, what it actually looks like, the tangible product. And I would go so far as to say that they are, they are the best when it comes to accommodating these requests. Um, I deal with Rockwood, a sister company to Corbin, on a daily basis. They all but encourage you to ask for specials. Um, they do a real good job. We get in now into some of these Museo trim designs, decorative levers, okay? Nice looking decorative levers. You are not just stuck with a Yankee knob or a Newport lever anymore. You've got lots of options. And when you're dealing with Windstorm product, uh, the job that I did recently, and even though it was a sergeant mortise lock we did, um, because there was a Sergeant King system in the field at the condo building and they wanted to stick with Sergeant Locks, no problem. The availability of a Pebble Beach lever design from Sergeant uh, is what they ultimately selected. And Corbin Russwood would certainly have something quite similar to that. Beautiful levers are here. You know, point being options, lots of options. Scroll through here a little bit quicker. That behavioral health trim, that's a real, that's a real thing. Uh, we skip past the vandal resistant. Going to be a heavier construction. Going to give you security screws. Okay. Cast discussions and levers rather than anything wrought. Flush mounted cylinders where this is flush on the face of the unit. Nothing projecting that can be tampered with. Okay. The behavioral health trim, ligature resistant, curved faces, curved surfaces, same concept to a certain extent here. I don't have any experience with their push pull trim, but it's you know, getting in, staying within the hospital concept, the hospital um, category of applications, push pull, just a, you know, a, a 21st century take on push pull hardware. Anti harm knob. And it's all based on the needs of the marketplace and being responsive to it. This is where you get into the standard sort of material that we're talking about. What the lock can be normally supplied with. Your standard thumb turn is going to be listed here. Um, security thumb turns, you know, ADA compliant thumb turns. Occupancy indicators as we had talked about earlier. Continuing, continuing with more occupancy indicators. The Corbin Russwin occupancy indicators are nice because they're petite um, in your sectional trim. Occupancy ind indicator quick codes so you can figure out what's required on the locks, how to call it out as well. M19SN. Now we'll get into the cylinders. Let's, um, let's talk about the cylinders for a moment. 
now as we dive into the cylinder options from Corbin Russell, and we're just going to touch on it, but the point of the matter is whether you want patented high security, patented high security interchangeable core, you want master ring, you want six pin conventional, uh, six pin IC, seven pin IC conventional both ways. Flex head, that's an interesting type of cylinder construction that um, the head of the cylinder is literally connected to a couple of posts that have a couple of E-clips holding the cylinder face onto these posts to the cylinder body and springs are employed so that as you thread the cylinder in, should you have a door that's 1.71 inch thick or 1.875 thick, you can account for um, the different thicknesses that you'll encounter in a, in a, in a, in a large project. Uh, doors do vary in thickness uh, based on their construction. Um, concealed plug, uh, concealed shell is available as well, which would be here, concealed shell. Plug only to show. That's nice because, well, only the plug is showing. It's not only, uh, I think, more elegant looking, but it keeps the head of that cylinder away from anything that someone would like to do to the face of this. So lots of cylinder options, and obviously they're going to be able to um, provide, um, you'll obviously be able to, what I'm trying to say is, you'd obviously be able to run small small format through this as well, um, through a uh, through a uh, Corbin Russwin system. Uh, now, here's to where we started. ANSI straight lip strike, ANSI curved lip strike. This is the standard. If you're going to order this lock, I would definitely, I would suggest that you order it with a curved lip strike, but then again, you have to know the handing of the material um, because the holes are not the same, top and bottom, and uh, they're not reversible uh, in that regard. Okay. Curved lip strikes, there's going to be two of those, and if you study in your mind's eye why a right hand and a left hand reverse would of course be the same strike plate. I do wish that they included, as I said earlier, uh, uh, dust boxes, they don't. Um, they should. Open back strikes, those are really important pieces of equipment when you have pairs of doors and you are closing those doors and not necessarily are they being closed in the proper sort of sequence. Uh, you might have a need where the active door closes first or you might have a situation where the active door closes first um, and then the inactive door, if you had a scenario and an open back strike, by the way, is or, those are certainly handed. Those are ordered according to the hand of the lock that they go with, not on the door that they're installed on. Okay, so you got a pair of doors. Here will be your active. Here's your inactive. And you've got your, you know, your latch bolt that sticks out here, right? And you've got your, let's say it's a curved strike. What happens in the event when you have? Um, a pair of doors and they both have closers on them and when you open the active door the inactive is free to open okay the action of opening the active door will retract the automatic flush bolts on the inactive door but in an, in an event where you your active door closes is closed but your inactive door is still ajar you would use a open back strike, which is literally cut open on the face of this so that it can close over the latch bolt. It has a projection in the strike here that prevents the active door from being pushed open. And that's what an open back strike does. Okay. So we're seeing a left hand version of an open back strike list listed here is what we're seeing. Then we get a little, little bit further down we see the rabbited um, fronts and strikes and really what happens is you deal with these older catalogs you deal with these older catalogs and literally the hardware itself the lock itself is rabbited okay literally the hardware itself. Well, they don't do that like that anymore. Uh, generally, what you're going to bump into naturally is going to be the applied material 
uh, so as to emulate a rabbited scenario where you'll have your rabbited door okay and then your lock body is going to have to fit in here and they're literally going to you know give you well depending on um, you know what's got to happen you know what is the frame happening uh, etc those pieces are going to be added and I've had to go to another source um, to better show you accurate lock is a stock not stock but a relatively standard but highly capable of highly customized lock solutions and those rabbited kits they're just add-ons to the material so as to allow you to conform with the requirements of a rabbited door edge okay so they're added pieces if you notice that traditional style sure did look like that traditional style that we showed here with this radius scalloped sort of feature to it okay and that would be here inside of here but they're added pieces um, and that's typical that's normal nothing unusual about that that allows them to take a standard lock and add the piece so that you can have um, a rabbited sort of environment you know rabbited doors are really nice um, because they're quite effective at not only weather stripping uh, for the intrusion of you know cold heat air wind but noise as well rabbited door edges are really nice okay now let's continue to scroll through electrified options we're going to skip mostly over that there's a power supply here for your electric lock options um, more electrified options and then we get down to the uh, near the end of the product catalog in the sense that every every manufacturer is going to basically tell you <clears throat> here's how we want you to order the lock so <clears throat> when you follow this sort of heading structure you're obviously going to have your quantity <clears throat> if you're dealing with keyed locks and the factory's doing key work you'll give them the industry standard nomenclature your function your trim your finish your hand <clears throat> then you'll get into those quick codes that I've not mentioned them but you see them all over the place well, how thick is the door uh, are there any other um, things that are important to know about if you wanted that optional curve lip strike these are your quick codes as well here <clears throat> any cylinder option but as you go through the catalog you're literally going to see the word standard as we did earlier with the straight lip strike that unless you specify otherwise you'll get standard okay so <clears throat> diving through the catalog unfortunately is mandatory because um, it, from the perspective that you want to get exactly what you want to get and going through the book is the way to go however um, this is the first cheat sheet and within the door and hardware industry standard nomenclature is built like this so when you are conveying your needs and, and requirements in this format it not only is accurate for the hardware distributor but for the manufacturer as well we all understand what we're doing and it's when, when we're using common language and it helps prevent mistakes as well when we order it uh, in this sort of fashion okay variations on how to order it based on their different collections then the quick codes um, and those are important because rather than writing out IC6 pin less core, just tell them CL6. Okay. I had mentioned small format earlier. Okay. High security cylinders, quick codes, finishes, etc. On and on and on. This is nice because door thickness. It's nice to know what the length of your um, how to build the part number of your lock based on your door thickness. And if you'll if you'll just take a look, two and a quarter is not unusual. D two one four. If we scroll back up to our how to order, D two one four. They happen to you know be working on a door that's two and a quarter inch thick and that's your quick code in terms of how to specify that 
Quick codes for those strikes we had talked about. Straight lip, curved lip. More quick codes. And then the suggested specification. This would be for an architect or someone helping, an architectural hardware consultant helping an architect put together construction documents. How to specify for vandal resistant trim, electrified lock options. How to reverse the handing, we'll pick that up in the installation instructions. And that brings us to the end of the product catalog. The, it, it, it's an overwhelming amount of information. All these quick codes, pages and pages and pages of them. Here's the good news. The manufacturer, manufacturer's uh, website, I use it all the time, contact. Um, oh, I'm on Seco, forgive me. I'm on the wrong manufacturer's page. I was a bit confused there for a moment. Corbin Russwin, manufacturer's page, contact. Lot chat. They're great. Their technical support people are really good. Um, but then also in their defense of why is it so complicated, why is there so much? Well, Corbin and Corbin Russwin have been in business since the mid, I don't remember the year that P.F. Corbin got started, but it's pre-Civil War. Um, so if you have 150 plus years of active hardware manufacturing and a lineage that goes back easily a century, easily a century. The fact that they keep it consolidated like this is actually a testament to how exceptional they've been able to distill it down into its constituent components. Let's move on to the template. We're going to talk about how to cut the door for our hardware. Now carrying on with our review of this lock and in particular the template. Um, one nice thing that I like about their templates is that it's all on one page. You get information for every lock possible and um, it's, it's just easy to follow in my opinion. We spoke earlier about the back set. You do need to observe and yes this is a jumbled mess down here um, but as we pick this all apart um, you know, this is the strike plate. Let's ignore that for right now. This is the metal door. Let's ignore that for right now. If you've got a metal door, it's probably already prepped. Then we're going to touch on the important aspects of, um, of this. So as we spoke about earlier in terms of the back set, we have our reference to two and three quarter back set. Center line, they're, they're telling you the center line of the bevel, so that's good. Not the high side, not the low side, but the center of the thickness. Two and three quarter back set, okay? You're going to have a center line of your lock, which is this dotted line here. If we follow that dotted line all the way, it'll be below the center line of our strike plate. And that relocation is three eighths of an inch, okay? Um, they literally need to drop the lock body down three-eighths from center line so as to stuff in the extra hardware, the deadbolt. If they didn't drop it down, the deadbolt would be hitting the screw up here on the strike. So that's literally why there's a relocation of center line. And it's three-eighths. However, in, in, in practice, if your um, strike location is 39 and let's say uh, 43 and 11 sixteenths inside of the header to the center line of the strike your door um, is going to be um, only a quarter inch lower so it would be 43 and 15 sixteenths from 43 and 11 sixteenths because you have that eighth of an inch margin at the head of the door. Okay, so you've got your frame. And if you measure on your frame down to 43 and 11 sixteenths to your center line, well, if you put your door in there, 
you've got an eighth of an inch margin. So when you measure on your door, you're only going to go down to 43 and a quarter inch more, which would be 15 sixteenths. So that's why that is the way it is. So the bottom line is this. You're going to have your strike location, most likely. Whatever that is, add a quarter inch to it, and that's what you measure on the door because of that eighth inch already at the underside of the head to the top of the door. Now you have the center line of your lock body. The center line of your latch, I don't know if that's really important. I don't think it is uh, for this abbreviated conversation. So now we know where to find the back set. We know where to find it vertically. Then we talk about how to drill all these function holes. And it's very rare that you're going to find a mistake in a template. Although, you know, in 30 years I may have found two and I called the factory and they were very grateful. Not Corbin Russ one, but, you know, they're grateful to see that there's something that's not right. And by the time you call them, they're already aware of it and it's already corrected. Um, so you're going to always have your center line of your lock and from there is what you're going to reference all of your important dimensions, even though you'll have to hop and then skip and then jump to get to where you want to be. You know, if I want to go from my little through bolt hole here, which I really wouldn't, or if I want to go from the center line of my spindle to my thumb turn, I've got to go down to the center line, up to the center line of the cylinder, and then down to the center line of my thumb turn. So you'll be taking, you know, three and five eighths, so you'll be subtracting inch and a half, and then you'll, you know, um, you're going to have, <laughs> my point is, is you're going to have to make some simple mathematic, mathematical calculations. And I think that learning the decimal version of all your fractions is really crucial because it's easier to do 3.625 minus 1.1875 to get you, you know, the dimension that you can plug in. You know, in fourth grade, when we when we were learning to subtract fractions, and it took a sheet of paper to do three problems, that was really great mental exercise. But at the end of the day, we just don't have time to do it the way we were taught in fourth grade. Um, so now you'll be able to locate all of your lines, all of your function holes. Then, here's what's important to know: all of these holes have letters associated with them, A, B, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Come up to your chart. What function are you doing? I'm doing an ML2010. I only need E holes and F holes. Thankfully, no A holes. Hardware humor. So we're going to do E and F. We're going to need that E, and it's telling us it's through the door. We're going to need our F, and it will tell us in two places through the door. That's it. You struck your horizontal center. You struck your vertical center. You put your uh, center punched uh, holes onto the door and you've made your preparations. It's especially important to understand again the center line and the bevel because if you're laying out the dimensions on each side of the door you have to be mindful of dealing with a beveled edge door because they really drive it home right here. Function, function holes for mortise locks are not they're forgiving but not very much so. They're not going to tolerate you being an eighth of an inch off. And if you're dealing with sectional trim, it's just lousy when your cylinder doesn't cover properly. So measure it correctly. Make your adjustment um, as needed. Um, if you've got a metal door, that pocket's going to be already made. If you've got a wood door, that's easy. You're going to make an eight inch tall pocket that's going to be inch and a quarter wide. And the depth might be 732nd of an inch. I forget that depth dimension. Um, this depth dimension. It's on here somewhere, certainly. Eight inch tall, inch and a quarter wide. You'll notice that your pocket is only five and five eighths tall. And then the depth of that pocket is referred to here, four and a half inch. The width of that pocket is going to be the J dimension, which is referred to here at inch and a sixteenth. Okay. If you are going to be cutting your doors, um, you know, there are tools. Porter Cable makes a nice complement of fairly robust tools for doing it by hand um, in the shop. They make mortise pocket makers, lots of templates, obviously routers. I've used that material literally thousands of times and it works really great for doing mortise pockets, which are super easy 
to do preparations in. Never a problem with that. Um, I think we've touched on the important aspects uh, on the template. Now we're going to move to the installation instructions. You know, before we get to the um, installation instructions, I do want to talk about the parts manual. Um, there are two of them linked down below. Mortise locks made after 2016. And it's a really helpful document. It will give you every piece, every subcomponent. A lot of people buy subcomponents from their locks. We've got a hospital in, well, somewhere in New England. And they routinely buy loads of parts because they've got hundreds of deployments of Sar uh, Corbin Russwin locks. And they're always keeping them going by simply rebuilding the parts that fail because these locks are literally getting hundreds of thousands of uses, millions of uses beyond what they've been tested to. Um, to the installation instructions, uh, gonna, th these locks are easy to install. Um, however, if you're dealing with a keyed function lock, this is the page on which they tell you how to um, rehand the lock should you need to. First of all, if it's a keyed function, there's going to be a red screw right there. At least it's currently red. Right in front of the hub. That red locking screw uh, needs to be on, installed on the side of the body that is locked or the trim is rigid, I should say. If you have an ML2032 where both sides are always rigid, you'll have a screw on each lock case. Should you need to reverse that latch bolt, that's just literally as easy as pulling it out um, and turning it around. However, As we look at the the red screw, we can understand that, but reversing the latch body, that's not so simple. So let's hop on the camera and take a closer look at that. So what they're saying is, and, and you kind of literally need to follow the instructions, you push in the latch. You push it in. Then they want you to insert a screwdriver into the catch plate. And the catch plate is this little s silver piece here. Well, my screwdriver is a bit big, but we're going to use my tip of my Allen key. And we're just going to push that catch plate in. And you'll notice that it's spring-loaded. When you push on it, you'll notice that it's spring-loaded. And then what will happen is the piece will literally separate. When you push in that little catch tab, the piece will literally separate from the plunger. You can see that I've separated. If I push it in, it grabs it push it in again and then I can separate it. Now at this point they want you to pull the latch out. Pull the latch out. Latch doesn't come out. Okay. You need to get that you need to get the deadlocking tab, well the um, the, the um, I forget what this part is called this portion of the latch bolt. You need to get it worked. You've got this little tang right there that's holding it up. We need to work that out. And the best way to do that is to simply push the latch all the way in, and then you can literally manipulate this latch. After it's pushed all the way in, you can manipulate the latch and get it to, for lack of a better term, pop out, and it will come out. You don't need it to come all the way out. Nothing's going to happen, but you can then turn it over. Now this client, I don't recall the hand of this door. This is a left hand, so we're going to set it up for him so that it is a left hand. And indeed, reversing it would give us the proper handing for a left hand door. And as I get this put back together, I can see my part has fallen out of position. So I need to literally get that laid, laid flat, first of all. And my latch put back in so that it's in a left hand orientation. And now I can see that I've got it way too jazzed up. 
because I was holding it vertical. Now we're going to get the screwdriver and pull the cover off. We're going to do that right now. And we're going to reposition the camera to get it down on my desktop so we can see what I'm doing. I guess I'll, I'll do it um, upside down. There's probably a screw underneath the label, which there is. I'm going to pull that screw out. Apparently there are uh, three screws from what I can see. This is a passage set, so not a lot to be worried about. Put your hand on top of here. You don't want anything to pop loose. But I do not encourage you to open up the cover unless you need to. Okay, and as we have the last screw pulled out, I'm just going to carefully remove that cover. And there's not a lot in here, as you can see. But what has occurred is my little gizmo he got over on his side. So I'm just going to take that and I'm going to pick that up and put it back into an orientation where I can, you know, then expect my lock to go back together. Yeah, okay, so I have... I basically have it in a decent enough position, and I won't screw the lock body together until I know that I have the... latch bolt connected back how I want it. I sure realize it's easier to and if you were you know basically trying to rehand the lock you wouldn't tip the lock body over as I had and it does basically need to be in the flat you know orientation um, I do have that put back together And the smart thing to do is going to be to, of course, screw the lock body back together. But I've got that set. And a lock body is really not going to work super smoothly without the armor front, because it really takes the armor front to keep that auxiliary latch in place. So let's put, a, put our screws back in here and make sure that our case is flush and secure. I'm always keeping pressure on it because I don't want it to pop loose because as you may have noticed there are certainly springs inside of the lock case. Tight but not, a, you know, just hand tight is all we need does appear to be completely flat. My margin is good on the lock case. And my latch works. And now I've got it set up as a left hand. Okay, So we've, we've successfully reversed it even though it's not quite as simple as it might seem in the installation instructions. And we might literally just simply need to um, you know, you, you get into something, you experiment with it a little bit you figure out exactly what's working and what's not. And then, uh, you know, having done this in the past, I knew it was going to be a matter of having to take that lock body off. Uh, but again, we are dealing with pushing that little silver tab in because it's connected to the shaft that in this hole here, there's a gray round silhouette that you can't tell is moving, but it's going through there. And once you release that, you can then carefully remove that, playing with this auxiliary latch, turning it over if you need to, putting it back in, and then getting it to clip back into the catch plate, is what they're calling it. Okay. Um, let's take a look at the rest of the installation instructions now. And now that we have the challenge of the reversing of the lock body, you know, and what I say is just order it from the factory, the proper handing, and, you know, hopefully it's just going to come in correct, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. The factory does an exceptional job. 
Um, but as we go through the installation instructions, you know, uh, what's going to happen here is the mortise case is going to go into the door first and you will use the screws that are provided. I like to leave those loose just ever so slightly. And then you have your in, uh, outside and inside adapter plates that are listed here. Then you'll mount your escutcheons literally over those. And I think the thing to do is to do this, you know, show the parts as we go through it. So if you'll leave the document open, um, we're going to do this um, on camera, so to speak. I think it's a little bit more valuable. Picking it up back on page three of the installation instructions, you know, that mortise body goes in first, and then they're talking about your adapter plates. And obviously any side like this is going to be the exterior, okay? They're going to want you to bring that bushing down into the center of it like that. That's going to go through. That's going to go, of course, through your lock body, right through those holes, okay? Your in interior escutcheon will then come. The two screws are included through the interior escutcheon into the tapped holes here. And now you have the surface onto which your escutcheons will fit over. And let's grab the exterior escutcheon. And just to show what that's going to look like. Okay. The key being here, you've got this lever with nothing, then this lever with the spindle. Well, what happens is the screw that's in the base is going to connect into this yoke. yoke. And obviously this has to be the inside because it's got the screw. So this will insert through your escutcheon all the way through. take a closer look at why that spindle is not happily going through the hub itself. It of course does indeed go through, you just have to separate it. Okay, So this it has a small little taper to it here and that will certainly fit into the exterior. Once again, without the armor front, the lock just doesn't work as it should. To get that latch bolt in the right orientation, it will fully retract. Then, of course, that same end with that small taper, that will go in, and it goes in on a diamond, and that will fit in there. And then, of course, your bolt will go through. That will lock everything together. And after you get that threaded in, Okay. They're showing you that your spindles need to be on a diamond pattern on the bottom of page, in figure 11 of the bottom of page 3. Then in pay, on page 4, you'll have to remove your um, uh, set screw, basically, and be able to get that hole that's going to be presented down through the yoke of, the, of, your, of your bolt. Okay. That'll go in, you'll tighten, the, you'll tighten the screw through that, and then you're done. Are you done? Let's take a closer look. The only thing, the, the only thing we've not done is install, literally mount the uh, escutcheon plates over it. And they do give you an indication of what the cylinder is supposed to look like. Um, and again, be mindful if the latch is funny, not working correctly, it doesn't have his armor front. Lock case in, mount your adapter plates, your escutcheons split apart your spindle, install the exterior through the outside, bring through the interior the interior half of the spindle. And this is called a swivel spindle. Um, separate those, feed them in from either side accordingly. 
the set screw goes through the yoke and the adjusting bolt. At that point, you then at that point you are done. Um, <clears throat> scrolling through the rest of the installation instructions, it's just um, it doesn't apply because we're not doing a half installation. So you get to page four and you're literally complete with the installation instructions. Um, looking at the rest of the documents that that is that are listed down below, we obviously have the parts manuals, both pre and post January of 2016. We have. We'll get to the link to the manufacturer's page in a moment. We have the template. We have the installation instructions. We have the product catalog. We have the cut sheet. That link to the manufacturer's page to wrap this video up will get you to the full line catalog. We'll get you to those old archival catalogs should you feel interested to look through those. It will get you to that cylinder manual as well, um, along with all the Corbin Russwin products that we sell, as well as a, um, a link to the manufacturer's website where I showed you the chat earlier. If you've bought the material from us, I do encourage you to reach out to us with any questions that you might have. Um, you know, Corbin Russell, Corbin, PF Corbin, Russell Irwin, um, your sergeant, your Yale, Yale, and they're all sister companies. They are the co-founder of Yale, Linus Yale Jr., literally um, brought to our modern day in 1849, or thereabouts, I forget the date, maybe 1860. The patenting of the modern pin tumbler cylinder um, wasn't a thoroughly original idea. Literally 4,000 years ago, the Egyptians had this pin tumbler idea um, that he must have been aware of because the design is too similar uh, for him not to have been aware of the Egyptian uh, design. Um, sister companies, and you're dealing with people who are solidly mid 19th century origin. Um, you get to an exceptional lock company like Schlage. Um, they were in business 70 years before Schlage got started. Um, and, and Schlage's great. Um, and I don't mean to mention them in a Corbin Russwin video. I mention them because Corbin Russwin had decades of experience under their belt before Schlage was, any, was even a twinkle in his daddy's eye, so to speak. Um, so it's referencing a great company to kind of give credence to how long Corbin Russwin's been around. Um, I find their technical service basically very responsive. Um, a couple of hiccups along the way with information that doesn't seem to add up. Um, but since I don't work at the factory, you know, you're not really privy to every ounce of information that you would really love to have in the world of knowing how all these parts work. Um, any questions on the Corbin Russwin on this ML 2010 function or any other Corbin Russwin lock, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you.